Okay, let's get this done. Week three, part three, church vision. Here's the deal. Next week, we're doing a free flow service. You're right, Fathom, now I'm talking in my preaching voice. You're right. Earlier, I was just in like normal conversation voice. Yeah, the kids are right there, you're right. Now I'm in my preaching voice, you know? What's up? What's up? I wonder if people see these videos on YouTube and they're like, why do they put the stuff that's not sermon in the video? But I'm like, also, here's the deal. This is what you're gonna get every week. So if you show up, I'd rather you not be surprised and know that we're gonna have like six minutes of interlude of talking about whatever. Sometimes it's my pants because my son and I are matching. Sometimes it's Jesus, you know? You never know. Sometimes it's Kiki's hair. That looks so great. So great, right? Dang, turn up for the turn up. Look at you. Show up, maybe I'll compliment your hair too. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Anyway, week three, part three, church vision. Uh, next week we will have a free flow service. Um, so if you have never been part of a free flow service and you've been wondering what all of those canvases are up there on the wall, uh, we will have another set of canvases for everybody to write on and um, do something with. I don't know what the theme will be next week, but um, that will be next week. And then the first week of February, we will be starting Holier Than Now. So again, grab a book and wake up early and get here early because church is gonna start at 10 o'clock. I am saying it a lot. I am saying it a lot. We will start at 10. I'm saying it mostly for myself, but then also y'all can't be mad when service starts at 10, because we gonna do that. So now that all the things are out the way, part three, I've said 18 times, church vision, part three. Today, we are covering um, the plan of action. So we'll recap our mission to love and lead others into an ever flourishing relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what we are here to do. It is our version of going and making disciples. Um, every church that is a church, every Christian that says Jesus is their Lord and Savior, your mission every day is to, one, love the Lord your God with everything you have, love your neighbor as yourself, go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, go cast out devils, go heal some people, all the things, we're gonna work on the other parts, I promise. But we're gonna tap in the correct way so that we can actually do those things. Anyway, this is our mission, love and lead. In my love, my love action towards people, they will see something is different about me. They will see something is different about how I present myself, how I treat them, how I treat strangers. People will see that, people will feel that, people will know that. And by doing that, they are now uh, tapped into who I am, what I am doing. And because now that they are tapped into the love that I am giving that is from God, I can bring that person or lead them to Jesus in prayer. This is not necessarily me grabbing their hand and bringing them to church on a Sunday morning, but through my love action and my bringing them to Jesus in prayer, it is a double edged sword that works on their spirit day by day as I just do what I am called to do, just being a good person in Jesus, Jesus will do the rest. And so that is what love and lead means, loving and leading people into an ever flourishing relationship with Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, without Jesus, we cannot get to the Father, none of this matters. Next, our values, authenticity, biblical teaching, life-changing community, surrendered worship, and intentional service. These are the things that I pray every time somebody walks into Oasis, they feel this. They feel these things, they know these things. Like they may not be able to put these words to what they feel or what they see, but they can kind of describe it without having these words. So we talked last week, authenticity, me being real with God, like David in Psalm 51, yo, I am not perfect. I don't know everything. I don't have it all together. Lord, you're the one, please help me. And guess what? He's a good father who's like, I got you. I got you. I saw somebody post it on their stories the other day. Have y'all seen that picture where it's like a journal and it says, dear God, and then it's just like teardrops on it, on the page, you know? 
as much as I love and empathize with that, because yes, he's a good father who's like, yo, don't cry, bro. You know, don't cry, sis, I got you. Also, be real with him through that process. You know what I'm saying? Let it out. Talk to him. You're not going to scare him. You're not going to catch him off guard. You're not going to surprise him. Be honest and authentic with your father. Further, being authentic with each other, being real, not being nice. We, in churches, for whatever reason, equate Jesus to niceness, and then niceness means that we don't say anything wrong, or not wrong, but we don't say anything that is real. We don't say anything that can be taken as harsh. We don't tell the truth because we want to be nice, because Jesus was nice. I don't know where we picked that up, but that is not the truth. I mean, Jesus was nice, but he wasn't like creepy nice. You know what I'm saying? So we just like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm struggling right now. It's like, well, you're struggling to be obedient because that's, <laughs> that's your only problem with Jesus. That's a very simplified version of a lot of layers. I'm not gonna go into it, but being real. How can we live in life-changing community if we are not real with each other so that we can actually carry each other's burdens? How can we actually grow together if Kiki doesn't know what my goals are? How can she encourage me throughout the year to continue chasing my goals? How can Marissa know how to pray for me if I don't let her know the things that I need prayer for? Again, if I'm being authentic with God, he's the one who can put me in heaven. He's the one who can put me in hell. He's the one that can put people in my life to better my life. Nobody else can do that. And if nobody else can do that, then I have nothing to be afraid of in telling you guys the truth of where my life is. That makes sense? Authenticity. So next is biblical teaching. Everything comes from the Bible. Always and forever. Every single thing. Why? The Bible is the word of God. I saw a video the other day where the lady was like, God's revealed word is the Bible. Does it cover every single topic that you will ever think about? No, it does not. But it does cover the thing that matters. And that is your heart, your will, your emotions, your desires, your impulses, your thought process. It covers all of that. It covers your relationship with the Father. As I tap into this relationship with the Father, everything else will work itself out for real. If you have to ask, if, is this okay? Then it's probably not okay. Don't do it. It's very simple. If I have to ask, like a kid, um, a kid knows when they have not had lunch and they're about to ask for some Oreos. Um, and you know, the, you know before the question even comes out how they're posturing themselves. Um, hey, dad, this is Trey, of course. Uh, hey, dad, is it a great idea if we have Oreos right now? No, son, it's not a great idea to have some Oreos right now. I knew your question was coming before it was even coming. Relax, sit down, stop trying to finesse your boy. I don't know where I was going with that, but I don't know. I don't know how we got there. Anyway, biblical teaching, everything comes from the Bible. Oh, if you're asking things because the Bible covers your heart, that's why. That's how we got there. Okay, everything from the Bible, whether you are preaching, whether you are teaching, small group, kids, whatever, everything comes from the Bible because we want to know Christ and we want to know him crucified because that is the way back to the Father. Next, life-changing community. Again, coming together, meeting, praying for, confessing, forgiving, all of those things, being a place where we legitimately can talk to each other about whatever it may be without judgment, because again, we all know and understand, I have no high horse to sit on. So if I have no high horse to sit on, you have no high horse to sit on, we might as well just talk about the horses we don't have so that we can actually grow and be built up together. That's actually how you have life-changing community. And the scripture we used last week, we are going to cover again today. Surrender worship, the path of the tabernacle, enter the gates with thanksgiving, sacrifice, washing in the word, communion with Jesus, life in the spirit, intercession for those who cannot do it for themselves, and then living life with the manifest presence of God both on Sunday mornings, that is what we follow, 
And I can do this every single day of my life. If you want way more breakdown, you can read How to Worship a King, or you can go and watch our sermon series on the tabernacle. And then lastly, intentional service. This word service is where we get the word deacon from in uh, English, diakoneo or something like that, diakoneo. That's what it is. Deacon, to serve, to bring aid, to wait upon. That is what it is. And I chose, we chose intentional service on purpose because we want to be a church that makes the choice to do. We are constantly making that choice. That is something that I really would love for us to be aware of, to intentionally serve. Not that it falls in my lap, but like we can see the needs and that we go and we deliver aid. So those are our values. And today, the plan, how do we make this happen? How do we get people to see this, to get into it? Um, how do you get people to life change? And further from there, where do they go? So in my notes, I say a recap values, keep it short. I think I kind of did that, but too late. We're already here. Engage, equip, and empower. That is how we uh, get to our mission. That is how we allow our values to play out in real life. Engage, equip, and empower. Let's just jump into it and uh, knock this bad boy out. So number one, engage. To participate or be involved in. That is the definition. To participate or to be involved in. As always, we look to the early church to see what they did so we can see how we can do that today. So Acts 4, 23 through 37 reads, and I did not choose chapter two because they were a little bit, I liked the back and forth in the story of Acts 4 versus Acts 2. So that's why I chose that. Anyway, let's read it. When they were released, this is Peter and John, they healed the guy and then the Pharisees were mad that they healed him, and so then they put him in jail, and then they had to go before the guys, and they're like, yo, like, we don't know anything except Jesus, and we just told him to stand up. Jesus actually healed him. I just said, stand up, because I don't have no money, so I gave him what I had, and then it says, literally, I think like verse, I don't know, somewhere in the teens, it says that they realized that Peter and John were common, uneducated men, they literally looked at these guys and said, these dudes are idiots. And I don't know about this whole Jesus thing, but <laughs> they're dumb. What's the point of putting them in jail? Sure, leave. So that's where we get to this part of the story. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest said and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, the friends, when the friends heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father, David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed for truly in this city. There were gathered together, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the full number of those who believe were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them 
and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, engage. There's a lot of stuff going on here. I want to break down real quick, and then I want to go into how that relates to us here. One, Peter and John go back to their friends who are believers. That is number one. Peter and John went back to their life-changing community. That is who they went to. Hey, let me tell you what happened. Number two, those same believers went straight to God in prayer. It does not say here that they talked bad about the Pharisees and the chief priests and all those people. It didn't say that they sat there talking about, you know, to Peter and John. You know what? Those guys are douchebags, Peter. You right. I'm not going to say what just popped in my head, but it was not nice. The Bible doesn't say that they was like, yeah, man, they just a bunch of, you know, like they didn't say that. What did they do? They went straight to God in prayer. Number three, it says that they were of one heart and soul. When we read through chapter four, we looked up both of those words and both those words mean that their affections and their desires were all for the same thing. Their affections and their desires were for the same thing. Life change in Jesus. Do you want to know why churches, at least one reason why churches are not doing what Jesus intended? Because we are not of one heart and soul. Everybody's showing up for something different. That's crazy. When you think about that, some people show up to get something from Jesus. I need this fix this week. Some people show up because their kids are going to be upstairs and they will have a break from them. You laugh, but there are a lot of people when we started back up and we weren't doing kids because one, we didn't have anybody who would do kids. We have people say, well, you know what? That's the one time a week that I get a break from my kids. I'm not coming back until you got childcare. Crazy, right? And then you say, hey, we got childcare, and they're like, oh, y'all don't have live music, so I can't do that either. But you play, you play. The, if you came back, we could have some help. Cause you, okay. One heart and one soul. We show up for different reasons outside of, I need Jesus to show up and give me something today that will get me closer to the Father. That's crazy, because even for me to show up and I got to do a sermon, I still need to show up <laughs> going, Jesus, I need something today that is going to get me closer to you. Thankfully, it happened during Great Are You, Lord? Oh, man, the Lord is great because he is life and love and hope and restoration. Thank you, Lord. They were of one heart and one soul. Their affections and desires were for the same thing. And then, number four, there was not one needy person among them. Everything was taken care of because they all took care of each other. So when it comes to engaging, it looks the same. For us, the authenticity that we have with God, it plays right into me engaging with the Father on a day-to-day -day basis. I have to engage with the Father. Before I can even do anything here, I have to make sure I'm checking in with God every single day. Sometimes multiple moments a day. And sometimes those moments are, thank you, Lord, for today, whatever may bring. And then an hour later, Jesus, if you do not stop this child from whining about nothing, I'm going to rip his voice box out. Help me, please. That was this morning, by the way. I was like, Jesus, I'm going to kick him. I'm going to just punt him into the roundabout outside. 
because then at least that's the way he's over there crying and I don't have to listen to it. Help me, Jesus, please. Multiple times a day, check in with the father. Anybody else been there? I'm not crazy, right? Okay, thank you, Fathom. He was just standing there. I said, what are you crying about? I said, you don't even know, do you? No. Sit down and eat. Because that's the problem. You're hungry. <laughs> Sit down and eat. Anyway, engaging with the Lord multiple times a day, every day. I've got to be present and active in my relationship with him which then allows me to engage with everyone here. I have to show up. I've got to be present. You know what I'm saying? We've all been in a church where we show up and we're like, oh, they were just not nice. Nobody said hello to me. Nobody gave me the special visitor's parking. I didn't get a cup or a tote bag. I just sat there. Nobody said anything. The whole service. Well, did you say hi to anybody? No. Okay. Because it's okay to walk into a church for the first time and go, hey, I'm Rafer. I'm new here. I'm just trying to figure some stuff out. I have to engage with where I am. I have to engage with those who are here. And so it's not because I just need good friends and a great community. It's also for Jesus to be active in the room that much easier. That makes sense? Because if I can engage and we are all again on one accord, because now Fathom can pray for Destry because they had a little chit chat before they came in. Okay. I can carry that burden in the middle of worship. You know what I'm saying? He uses, his people to help his people. he uses his people to help his people. But we show up and we expect these people to do everything for us with us without us having to do anything. And I want to be a Christian. I want to be a part of a great church where everybody else does all the things. I want to be a part of a really great church where like they do stuff. Well, what, are you part? Of, oh, no, I, no. I, it's a great church, though. The music is great. <laughs> we explain all the things about the church, but I am not actually part of the community. I got two or three people that I do talk to, and that's it. It's a hard stop for me after that. But I have to engage. I have to engage with Jesus, with each other in service. Again, we show up and we're here. I did it. I came to church. But if I am not actively going, hey, Jesus, what is it? So when I'm over here walking and I'm surprised by the lyrics of Great Are You, Lord, because that's a song that I've known for seven years, but I was engaged in the service. I'm engaged with not just what is happening with the music, but what Jesus is actually trying to show me. That's so huge because like we expect every Sunday to get this huge mountaintop faith mm -hmm. experience. Talk. Like the rest of the days, like we're not even praying without season. Talk. Continuous conversation with God. Talk. And it's not even like whenever you talk to your dad, it's not like you're always having something serious to say to him. Mm -hmm. like sometimes I just call my dad to be like, Man, I don't understand why it's so windy and cold in New Mexico. And he's like, yeah. And it's like the same exact thing. We shouldn't have to always go to God and be like, man, God, this is some heavy stuff going mm -hmm. on. We could just be like, hey, God, I had a pretty good day and it's super windy. And I don't get it. <laughs> That's it. For real. Staying tapped in, man. You're going to love this book, by the way. Staying tapped in. Because at any given moment, he is going to respond back. He's going to probably say, well, yeah, I'm trying to get Clovis to build more buildings so the wind isn't as crazy, but they don't listen. So <laughs> I don't know. He may say that. We can't expect it to be wrapped in how we 
we want it. Because sometimes <coughs> it's a no or not yet or just this is a your time. Sometimes he chuckles at me. He yeah. laughs at me sometimes. Yeah. Most of the time it's when I'm like complaining about Trey. He's like, ha ha. Have you dealt with yourself? I'm like, you're right, Lord. I'm going to be quiet. You're right. You're right. I'm going to be quiet. Staying engaged. Events like last night, s'mores, hot dogs, Chris and Jade. Go to the things. I didn't go because I was tired, which is a legit reason. I was up the night before. Man, I thought I was going to throw up. Neither here nor there. Go to the things. Because again, here on Sunday morning, our time is very limited, right? So how else am I going to engage to get to the point where I go, oh man, Keisha's really cool at the things. Well, I can't do the things because the things are always at a time where I can't do things. Okay, reach out to someone and then go do things with them. Engage in the body. Jesus each other service events. Engaging is huge. We do not get anywhere if we don't participate or involve ourselves in what is happening. We get nowhere if we do not participate. Lastly, as a church body and members of this body, it is our job to engage those outside of this body to love and lead them into an ever flourishing relationship with Jesus Christ. That makes sense? Cool. Equip. This is probably my favorite part of the plan until the next part. Yeah, that's what I said. Ephesians 4. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This word equip means to make full ready. To make full ready. The saints. We those who believe in Jesus, who are now covered by the blood, are now saints. It's a very simple concept because it's like, oh, I'm not a saint. You believe in Jesus? Yes. Are you saved? Yes. Okay, guess what? Boom. Saint. There you go. So to make full ready the saints, us, for what? For the work of the ministry. And guess what that word ministry is? Service. What? We talked about that last week. To make us full ready for service. Is that tied to anybody else? He gives all of these things to equip us for service. That is not the Christianity that most of us know. Crazy, right? We just know Jesus will love me and take care of me. And so I'm ready to be taken care of. I am so ready to be taken care of. I am equipped to receive the ministry. But it's actually the opposite. We are equipped to serve. And specifically with this, and this goes back to what Fathom said, this this specific word of ministry is teaching. We are all, everyone, are t- we are all being made full ready so that we can teach each other so that we can all together grow up 
into a mature body of Christ. That's tight. That's crazy. We are all given teachers, prophets, all the things he listed for the sake of us learning and growing so that we can teach each other as a body so that we can grow up and mature together in the body of Christ. The body of Christ, we need each other to give each other all the things that we need so that we can do this like Jesus actually intended. So when it comes to Oasis, my job as your pastor is to do everything that I can to make sure we are doing this as a church. It's my responsibility to make sure that you can see the father as he should be seen. It is my job to make sure that there are no obstacles to finding freedom in Jesus. So every single week when I say there are free books over there, we are about to study. We buy Bibles for everyone because that Bible, depending on when you need it, Sometimes it's $30, sometimes it's $45, sometimes it's $60. Like when the pandemic started and everything shut down and I was trying to buy Bibles like we normally do, and everybody's like, oh, we need Bibles now. It's like, oh, now y'all need Bibles? Fine. By all means, go ahead. <laughs> get Bibles, please. But they were like 50 bucks for just a hardback. Normally you get like a leather one for 65, you know? But just a hardback was like $50. But we do that. The church takes on that price point. So people have no excuse in not having one. I can't afford the Bible, so I can't study. Well, Rafer's pastor says, well, I'm going to take that excuse from you because it is my job to make sure you are full ready to serve and to teach. It's my job to make sure that everyone here is full ready. Because when I stand before Jesus, he is not going to say, Rafer, you did not do as I asked you to do. I'm not going to be the one standing there going, well, Lord, I just, no way. It is my job to make sure that every person here has no excuse to be full ready to share with anyone how good Jesus is. Zero excuse. So when it comes to how am I going about this every day in my personal life, it is my growth. I have to read something. I have to study. Not just read my Bible. Hey, go home and read your Bibles, guys. No, 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 no. Go and study. Oh, there's a book you don't know how to study. One, we do this every year. So you should know how to study. Because I know we walk through how to look up words, what definition you're looking for in relation to the scripture. Again, the books, I'll buy any study guide you want. I'll buy anything. I will buy any book you need. But I have to dig into my own personal growth myself. I have to make sure I am taking care of my relationship with Jesus. I have to. And then again, Fathom and Gracie, both preaching my sermon today, learning from others, sharing with others. I have to learn from everyone else. I don't have it all together. I don't know everything. And that's probably my favorite thing about how we do church on a Sunday morning, that anybody at any moment can say whatever they need to say. Because there may be something that I skip over. There may be something that you have that is pertaining to you specifically that may pertain to somebody else that I may not see. You know what I'm saying? I think that is so cool. And so as we equip each other, I also have to be ready to equip everyone else around me. Again, there is zero excuse on how to do that. Lastly, empower. This is my favorite one. 
since the last one was my favorite one. At the Last Supper, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts, the Holy Spirit falls on individuals in mass for the first time in history. And then we begin to see multiple people doing things that only Jesus and a few others had done before. That's those scriptures. I'm not going to read those. That's what I just recapped real fast. So don't worry about going there. But when it comes to being empowered, one, everything is going to be through the Holy Spirit. Everything is going to be through the Holy Spirit. And I love the empower part of this because this is where I feel Oasis thrives in who we are and what we do. So 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. I need everybody to remember that when we start breaking this down. If the foot says, I'm not a hand, so I don't belong to the body, that does not mean that the foot is not a foot. You're still a foot that has to walk. So I know you think you are worthless because you cannot play games on an iPhone, but you can get me to the couch. Please do your part. Anyway, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? Where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. He then goes into chapter 13, and we call it the love chapter, and it comes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Anyway, empower. Everyone has something to offer to the rest of the body. Every single person sitting here who calls Oasis home has something to offer Oasis specifically and the greater body of Christ as a whole. I know this because the Bible literally just said it. I did not make this up. I did not pull this out of my butt. This is literally something that we just read. As long as I'm the pastor here, we are going to again live this out. I refuse to be the person and the pastor who is going to take on unnecessary responsibility because that is not my job. I have a job to teach. 
I have a job to pull people together. I have a job to make sure on a grand scale and sometimes in one-on-ones or two-on-ones to make sure people are seeing Jesus with everything that they have. Now, finances, fathom. What kind of router do we need? Eric. Events, Natasha. Kids, Danielle. There are things that people have that I am not going to do because I do not have that. So when people come to me and they have an idea, Gracie will tell you, she sent me 18,000 ideas, a bunch of them. Have we done any of those ideas? We have not, but they are always in my back pocket and ready to go when it is time for those things to happen. I am here legitimately to hear what God is putting on your heart, what God has placed in you, what gift, what talent, whatever it may be. You do something better than anybody else here. And so it may be a Sunday morning where you give that. It may be a Tuesday night. It may be a Saturday morning. It may be a Thursday afternoon. You have something to give and offer this body. So people freak out when they come to me and we do have space for an idea. And I go, okay, cool. You do it. What? Uh, what? No, I, th I thought. Nah, you didn't. You thought nothing. You thought a really great idea that you are now going to lead. Let me know what you need. You need the church car? Here you go. Boom. Because again, if I, as a hand, say, well, you know what? I'm worthless. Or if I, as a hand, say, well, you're not a hand, so we don't need you. And the knee is like, okay. <laughs> Let, watch what happens. And so we do that in churches where we feel like we need to prepare people to do what God has given them. Or we feel like everybody needs to either be a hand, an eye, or an ear, and those are the three places. So either you're preaching, you're doing kids, or you're doing music. That's it. Those are the big three. And if we're not doing those big three, everybody else, I'm sorry. No way, man. There's too much that God has put in each of us for Rafer to stand in the way of that. I will never stand in the way again. And Gracie will tell you those conversations. Hey, right now, we don't even have any teens. But when we do, guess who I'm coming to? Hey, Gracie, remember those ideas you got? You know, you're cooler than me. You can talk to these kids. I got somebody in my back pocket right now. The moment 12 teenagers show up and they're like, we need something to do. Gracie, Gracie, Gracie! Is Jacob coming? Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I'll give y'all the key to the church. I'll unlock whatever. But we are ready and I know who is where and when we can use that. This is not the church where I'm just going to shut things down because it just doesn't make sense to me. I go again, it may not be the time, but if it works right now, bruh, I am going to empower you to do what God has put inside of you. That's what we are about here. We engage, we equip, and because we equip, use what, use the tools. Use the tools. Like the scripture said, we need each other to build each other. We need each other to build each other up. Again, my job is to equip you. It is to make sure you are equipped and then to make room for you to use the tools. Jenny all the time is like, yeah, the whole Dennis and Lorena and the, like the meal train. Jenny did all of that. She sent me the link. I made a QR code and put it in the slideshow. I know a lot of times when we like get into announcements and I'm like, I, I don't know anything. But that's because somebody does know because that's what they do. 
That is for them to do. And I would much rather you feel empowered in this church body, that you feel like you have something to bring to the table. By all means, please build each other up. It is always going to be about Jesus and what he intended for his church as a whole. So when you see engage, equip, empower in the pre-service or the post-service slides, this is what we mean. Join in, be part. Don't be the person who's waiting for somebody to say good morning. Just walk in and give, give everybody a high five. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Ms. Green. <laughs> Kevin, you know, but meet, engage, engage, be equipped, read the books. They're free for a reason. They are free for a reason. Read the books. If you're like, yo, I'm gonna read two books this year. You and Jesus read those books. I was just telling Eric earlier, I got a message from Anytime we do Bible study or a book or whatever, when I put it on the Oasis Instagram, I always say, yo, if you don't attend Oasis or you're not in Clovis because of the internet, like, let me know. We'll send you a Bible. We'll send you a book. We will send it to you. You don't have to pay for anything because the Bible says that, yo, they supplied the needs. They covered it. So who am I to go, oh, sorry, you don't go to our church. We can't buy you a book. What does the church have money for then? But a guy hit me up the other day. I sent him and his wife Bibles last year. And he sent me a message on Instagram and he said, hey, is there an Acts chapter 20 on YouTube? Because I'm not finding it. And it was like out of the blue. I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? And I was like, oh, so I go to YouTube and we did not do a chapter 20 because I think Jenny and I had left and there was a mix up and scheduling and all that. Anyway, I did chapter 19. Gracie did chapter 21. And um, so I explained that to him and I said, oh, well, since you are watching the Acts series on YouTube, we're about to do holier than thou next. So I said, if you want, I'll send you and your wife some books. And he's like, oh, you don't have to do that. We'll get them. I said, just give me your address. He gives me his address. Boom, because they live in L.A., so it was like tomorrow. I was like, tomorrow? Dang, look at that. Way to go, Amazon, you know? But they got two books. And so whether they join us on YouTube on Sunday mornings or not, or they read later and then they're watching later, they're being equipped. Be equipped. Use the tools. If you're like, yo, and I say it all the time, if there's a book that you have read, that you're like, yo, this really helped me. I think this will help a lot of other people. I'll buy five off top every time. There's a lot of books up there that I have not read, but I trust the people who are reading these books. And if they say, yo, this is a good book, I'll buy five. Use the tools. They are for free. And lastly, I empower you. I am here. It's a lot of pastors who want the power of pastorship that don't realize that like Jesus is the one that actually has the power. So I'm like, what are you doing? You know, did anybody listen to the Mars Hill uh, podcast, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, Mark Driscoll, that whole situation? No, thank you. I am not here. Oh, he was a mega church pastor. It's a, it's a crazy thing. We'll talk about it later. But... Um, he started very well in Jesus, wanted to do for and in. And then he began at some point to require the power. And I'm like, Juan, that's a lot to carry. That is a lot to carry. I'm like, the way I have to think to just deal with my son, because he is being, he's getting smarter every day. That's where my brain power is. The last thing I need to do is make sure that people uh, are doing what I want them to do on a Sunday morning. No, thank you. If my son don't listen, y'all not going to listen. You know what I'm saying? Like, fathom, you should not get out of here. What do I look like? 
But I want to do the exact opposite. I want to say, hey, use what you have, use what God has given you, be who you are. If you're like, yo, I'm just a great listener. I don't really have any advice. I just know how to be with people. Guess what? You are going to head up our Be With People ministry. Hey, who, who needs to cry today? All right, Jacob's sitting right there. He's just going to be there for you. That's not me, because I'm always ready with advice, you know? I'm always ready. Got to tell myself, Rafer, shut up. They did not ask you any questions. When I say they, I mean my wife. Just be quiet, Rafer. She just needs you to listen. I can do that. It's hard. I can do that. But there's some people who are like, yo, I am just a really great presence. I know this. I can just be there for people. I don't need to give advice. I can just do that. That is a gift that God has given you. You can do that. I'm just really good at praying. Not in public, but I can pray with people one-on-one. -on -one. Cool. Fine by me. I will never call on you on a Sunday morning, but I will send people to you all the time. That is what I want us to be. So we engage, you are equipped, and you are empowered to go and be and do all that Jesus wants you to be and do. So we're going to go to the holy place. We'll spend some time with Jesus. And then uh, we will be dismissed.